welcome to Ride School. We're so glad you're here. Come on in. Good morning, grace and peace to you. Welcome to worship at Wrightsville United Methodist Church this Sunday morning. We continue to journey towards the cross and the empty tomb as part of our season of Lent. As you can see on the beautiful altar behind us, we are broken vessels and yet God is not done with us yet. This morning, we have a special part of our service that we are going to be celebrating Holy Communion. And so we invite you, if you don't have it or have them, to pause the video and to gather some bread or a cracker and a little bit of grape juice for each person who is watching the service. Pastor Doug is going to lead us in the great Thanksgiving as we celebrate Holy Communion together even while we are apart. One other element of our worship that's new today, you will see, is the Apostles' Creed. We are used to saying it in worship each week, but now as we are this week in a year anniversary of the pandemic, we want to have folks leading that Apostles' Creed. So thank you to Courtney and Chris Rickert who are leading it for the very first time this morning. We would love for you or a group of family or friends or just you by yourself to lead that. And if you would like to sign up to do that, you can see the link in our e-blast or email me at christina t at rightsillumc.org. We are raising money um, and reaching out in mission and service this Lent through trying to raise $40,000 in 40 days for Eden Village of Wilmington which is an organization that is building tiny homes for people who are experiencing chronic homelessness. So we would love for you to donate to that. And we would also love for you to come out and see the tiny home today from 1 to 3 p.m. That's sponsored by Children of Joy. There's going to be trolley stop hot dogs. You can tour the tiny home. Lots of great stuff today. See our social media channels for more info. Also, we would love for you to be a part of the change of love and justice and peace in our world through participating in a couple of events through our racial unity group. They are hosting a cultural humility training uh, next Monday, March 18th, and the deadline to sign up for that is tomorrow, March 8th. That is going to include the IDI, a, a tool that allows you to grow more in your cultural awareness and also a one-on-one -on -one session with a facilitator and a group session together. Also save the date for a um, six-week series on race, church, and healing, and you can find info on that and costs in your e-blast. Last but not least, this afternoon is our final drive-in worship at 4 p.m. out in our gravel lot. We will continue to meet each Sunday at 4, but we're going to be moving as the weather heats up over to South Channel Park. However, if the weather is below 55 or raining, then we'll be back here in the gravel lot. So this week, for the last time, be in the gravel lot at 4. Tune in your FM radio or just roll down your windows. And next Sunday, we hope to see you out in South Channel Park for Worship on the Water. And now I invite you just to take a breath with me, to take a moment to text someone you are missing or a couple folks that you are missing from worship. May the peace of Christ be with you. invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. 
Almighty and loving God, you did not send your son into the world to condemn it, but so that the world might be saved through him. Through Jesus Christ, you bring salvation to the world. Give us strength to believe in him, that we may share in your love, that we may share in his victory over the powers of sin and death, that we may fulfill the purpose for which you have made us. Dwell in us and with us through your Holy Spirit. Open your word and illumine our hearts and our lives so that we may live faithfully by your truth in Jesus Christ. Amen. And now I invite you to join us in song. The words, as always, are found on your screen. Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Today's reading is from the Psalm of David, Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His
his eyes on the sparrow and I know he cares for me his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free his eyes on the sparrow and I know he cares for me his eyes on the sparrow and I know he watches me let not your heart be troubled his tender word I hear and resting on his goodness I lose my doubts and fears though by the path he leadeth but one step I may see his eyes on the sparrow and I know he cares for me his eyes on the sparrow and I know he's watching me I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free his eyes on the sparrow and I know he cares for me One of the greatest gifts that we have as Christ followers is the gift of prayer, the gift to reach out to God, even when it's difficult, even maybe when it feels like our words aren't getting any higher than the ceiling. We know through the eyes of faith that God hears us, that God responds to us, and that God loves us just as we are. <laughs> been thinking this week about what I was doing last year about this time. This Sunday marks about one year since most of us were gathered together in this sanctuary for worship. I don't think that we, any of us, knew what was ahead of us. And yet, we are grateful for the gift of our church that extends beyond walls and boundaries. We pray that as we continue to move forward in faith, that God would strengthen us, that God would watch over all of those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19, and that God would give us hope for tomorrow. So now I invite you to pray with me. Holy and merciful God, you are loving and you are merciful, even when the world is needy. You created us in Christ Jesus for good works, even when it feels like we don't know what we are doing. You have made us to follow the way of life that you have prepared for those who believe in Christ. You have made us to walk by your light, doing what is true. God, you have saved us, not by our good works, but through trust in your grace. Grant, O oh God, that the world may be drawn to your truth by our humble witness. Merciful God, hear our prayer. O oh God, in every age, you call forth people of integrity to lead your people in righteousness. We pray for leaders in the church, in the community, in our schools, in our world. We pray that your reign would encompass all the earth that we would dwell in peace, that we would promote the common good. Merciful God, hear our prayers. Oh God, in this year we are tired. <laughs> Many of us have been sick or afflicted. 
Many of us mourn those who have been lost. And yet, God, you hear our cry. Strengthen us. Raise us up on wings as of eagles so that when we walk, we would not grow weary. When we run, we would not grow weary. And when we walk, we would not grow faint. Save us, O God, from our distress. Heal us of our diseases. Deliver us from the destructive power of suffering. And for all who sorrow in distress, especially those we name before you now, merciful God, hear our prayer. O God, in Jesus Christ, you have shown your love for the world. Receive our prayers, O God. Give us strength. Give us safe places to be broken, to fall apart, to find people who will comfort us. And God, grant that we would also be those safe places, those comforters to others. Receive our prayers. Grant us from what we need. Grant us what we need and bring us to everlasting life. We ask all of these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray as he taught us to pray. And we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As people of God, we offer our gifts to God. And even while we are not able to meet in the building, we still are able to give so that God's ministry may go on. And so we invite you to give as our musicians play. You can give by check written out to PO Box 748, Wrightsville Beach 28480. You can give on our Wrightsville app or you can give on wrightsvilleumc.org. So let us give graciously and generously and thankfully to the God who gives to us.
UMC. We're so glad you're joining us this morning for worship. I'm Christina Norville, the Director of Children and Youth Ministries, and I have my daughter, Virginia Gray, with me this morning. And we are sitting inside of the first tiny home in Eden Village. Eden Village is a brand new community here in Wilmington, North Carolina that will provide 32 tiny homes to chronically homeless people. We are so excited about walking along beside Eden Village for this project. And we want to share with you a little bit this morning about Eden Village. So, we've been having a lot of cold, wet, rainy winter days. And I know we're kind of coming out of that, hopefully. But can you imagine with me for a minute not having shelter to go on days that are extremely cold and wet? Heartbreaking, isn't it? Some days, Virginia Gray and I were sitting inside our home and we were thinking about people that aren't as fortunate to have warm homes as we all do. So we feel very passionate about Eden Village and we wanted to share that with you this morning. Um, I do want to share a little bit uh, from one of my favorite books written by Kathy Izzard, and it's called A Good Night for Mr. Coleman. Parents, I highly recommend you pick up this book. It's good for kids and for adults, um, and it uh, helps, you know, explain a little bit. But it's about my friend named Grace, and she volunteers a lot. And when she volunteers, she met a man who was homeless, unsheltered, called Mr. Coleman. And she asked him why he doesn't have a home or a mailbox, and he says because he lost his job. And I asked him why, and he says it's complicated. And I asked my mom if Mr. Coleman can move in with us since he doesn't have a home, but she said no. And I asked why not, and she says it's complicated. Grown-ups always say it's complicated when they don't have the words to explain stuff, but I still wish they would try. I always thought Mr. Coleman and all the neighbors slept upstairs where I volunteered. So I asked my mom if she would take me to see Mr. Coleman's bed. She looks at me funny and she says, nobody sleeps here. Where is Mr. Coleman's bed? But where is his bed, I ask her. Mom doesn't answer. If he doesn't have his own bed, how does Mr. Coleman ever have a good night, I thought. It scares me to think about Mr. Coleman alone in the dark with no bed and no pillow and no bear like the one I hug at night. He doesn't even have a dog like my Rocky to protect him. Can't we do something about it? I ask my mom. It's complicated, she says, but I keep hearing a little voice that won't go away telling me to do something about it. So I decided to trust that whisper. The next day after school, I set up a lemonade stand with a sign that said, let's build beds, lemonade, $1. If I sell lemonade every day for a whole year, that would have to be enough to get Mr. Coleman his own bed. I tell Gigi, that's her grandmother, about Mr. Coleman and that he doesn't have a bed or a pillow or a bear or a Rocky. And Gigi says, we must do something about that, Grace. Then Gigi shows me a newspaper article about where some grown-ups are trying to build a whole apartment building for neighbors who don't have a place to live like Mr. Coleman, a lot like Eden Village. So I keep selling lemonade and mom helps me send the money I make to the grown-ups who are building apartments for neighbors who don't have homes. And Gigi gives them money too. I don't know how much, but mom says it was a lot. And guess what? All those dollars added up and the grown-ups really did build a building so that Mr. Coleman and lots of neighbors would have a bed and a pillow in their own homes. I thought Mr. Coleman still needed one more thing to have a good night, so I gave him my bear too. Now Mr. Coleman has his own home. That's just part of this story. You can read the whole story when you pick up the book, A Good Night for Mr. Coleman. But we would love for all the Mr. Colemans in the world to have their own bed, their own pillow, their own teddy bear, and a place to sleep at night. Virginia Gray is going to share with us a little bit about how our church is going to help with this. Yes. Our church's goal is to raise $40,000 
to sponsor a tiny home for a person in our community who needs shelter. It also breaks my heart when I see somebody in the street with no home to sleep in at night. And that's why we're making Eden Village. So people without a nice comfy home or a teddy bear can sleep in one of these houses and have their own home. And if you're at the Linton Fair, we there was a station that you could decorate these Eaton Village banks. And it's really cool because you can help save money for a tiny home that we are all building together. And if you need a bank, I still have many in my office. You can see me, email me, text me, and I'll get you a bank so you, your family can save money. So we want to invite you today to the open house at Eden Village. The Children of Joy and the 412 Youth will be sponsoring an open house this afternoon from 1 to 3. We're going to have trolley stuff and Kona ice, and you get to take a tour of this amazing tiny house. I want to live here. It's amazing. And so we invite you to come with your family, invite your neighbors, invite your friends, invite other people in the community to come see Eden Village and experience it for yourself you will fall in love. Thank you for being with us this morning. We love you all, and we'll see you soon in person. Bye. Bye. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good to be with you this morning. Uh, we have a familiar story with a very familiar text inside of it. Today we're going to be reading from John chapter 3, which is when Jesus meets with Nicodemus. And of course, that very famous scripture is John 3.16, which we will hear in the midst of the story. I invite you to listen. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we've seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you that you have sent your son, Jesus, into the world so that we might have life and have it eternally. Father, be with us now, and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, some of y'all know this already, but I love trivia 
and trivia questions. So I've got one for you today. Without looking it up, don't go to the Google. I just want you to see if you can figure it out. Can you correctly guess which movie was the most streamed movie of 2020? It was streamed for 15 billion minutes in 2020, with the second place finisher being a distant 10.5 billion minutes. Any guesses? Any guesses? Yes, you on the couch? All right, you got it? Are you ready for the answer? Do you need to pause the worship video a minute? Because here it comes. The most streamed movie of 2020 was Frozen 2. Frozen 2. You might have guessed that more readily if you had children at home. Of course, it's a Disney animated movie. And if you haven't seen Frozen or Frozen 2, I would tell you to just let it go. And fans of the movies would realize I just told a joke. But in all seriousness, the films depict two sisters who live in the make-believe country of Arendelle. In the first movie, we learn that the elder sister, Elsa, has special powers, but she doesn't know how to control these powers. So she decides to shut herself off from the rest of the world, including her younger sister, Anna, who desperately wants to spend time with her. But Elsa is terrified of hurting Anna and others around her, so she runs far away to the top of a high mountain where she can't possibly hurt anyone with her special powers. She knows she's unique, but it's the very thing that makes her unique that scares her to death. And so she runs away. She decides it's best to be all alone. This world of ours is filled with people who feel all alone. Sometimes it's because they feel different or misunderstood. And sometimes it's because they've been rejected by someone or a group of people. Many are looking for a love that will never disappoint them. And others have simply given up on ever finding such a love. And still others are looking for love in all the wrong places, as Waylon Jennings used to sing. The kind of love that will never disappoint or dissolve can only be found in a loving relationship with God. God is the only one who truly understands us better than we even know ourselves. And he never rejects us. But I think too many people believe that all God wants to do is to judge us. They have this picture of a God who is mean-spirited, unforgiving, and vengeful. But that's not God. Certainly not the relationship with God that I've experienced. Listen to these passages of Scripture. Listen to what Jesus himself said, and then listen to how the apostles Paul and John talk about love. Jesus said, as we just heard in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And then over in John, in 1 John, I might say, chapter 4, he writes, Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us of his spirit. And we've seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. 
So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. I don't hear judgment or fear in those verses. I hear something quite different, completely different. It makes me think about the first international mission trip that I ever took. It was to the small Central American country of Belize. The Caribbean waters off the coast of Belize are spectacular, and Americans like to go there to go fishing or snorkeling or diving. The largest city in all of Belize is only half the size of Wilmington, and most of the people live in small remote villages that are only accessible by poorly maintained dirt roads. We were working with a missionary in the southern part of the country that was close to the borders of both Guatemala and Honduras. The missionary had a relationship with some of the indigenous people in the mountains who were descendants of the Mayans. They lived in thatched roof huts and had no running water. The local pastor in the area was one of the nicest guys I had ever met. But in order to make ends meet, he had to work a second job at a local banana plantation. In fact, he told me he once killed a jaguar with just a machete when it attacked some people where he worked. Anyway, I'd been invited to preach a revival at this church that was a thousand miles from nowhere. It was among the hardest series of sermons I have ever preached. For while English was taught in school, it wasn't the language that most people spoke at home. Older people in the church wouldn't have been able to understand a word I said without a translator. And finding relatable illustrations was just plain hard. On Sunday morning, the local pastor led the weekly service. It was in the native Kekchi language and was not being translated into English. I didn't understand a thing. Until the pastor motioned for me to come forward. I have no idea what is happening. There are probably 300 people there and every eye is on me. As I come up on stage, the pastor whis whispers in my ear, Now you will do the baby dedications. Wait, what? There's no time to explain that this is not what we do in the United Methodist Church. We do baptisms, not dedications. In fact, I've never even seen a baby dedication. Not to mention, I didn't speak the same language as these people, which all leads to the fact that I have no idea what to do in this moment, and I have just been put on the spot. Well, one thing I had learned during the trip was that the people's understanding of Spanish was far better than their understanding of English. So in a Pentecostal moment, I suddenly remembered, ¿Cuál es el nombre de su bebé? Or, what is your baby's name? From my high school Spanish class. Apo. So I take baby Apo in my arms, and I begin to pray in English. The mother has no idea what I'm saying, but she's smiling and she's crying at the same time. She's clearly touched by this moment while hearing someone pray for her little baby boy by name. The mothers lined up down the aisle like we do at communion. One after another, they brought their little bundles of joy to this foreign English-speaking preacher to have me dedicate their babies to the Lord. After the service was over, the mothers and the fathers came up to thank me in that awkward way when you don't actually speak each other's language. There was just a lot of nodding and smiling, that kind of thing. I asked the missionary about the significance of having me do the baby dedications at lunch that day, and he said, you spoke their names. That was a really big deal to them. For when you, the American preacher, called each child by their name, they knew that God must know their names as well. And you see, that's the good news. God does know our name. God knows us more intimately than we know ourselves. God knows our comings and our goings. God knows our strengths and our weaknesses, 
our foibles and our failures. God knows our struggles and our desire to do what is right. God knows how easy it is for us to muddy up and cover our lives in filth. And God also knows how we rationalize and make excuses for our failures and faults while often judging those around us. God knows all that. And the surprising thing is, God still loves us anyway. Yep, God loves us anyway. No matter how ignorant we act or foolish we think, no matter how many times our brains descend to where we sit, no matter how many times we get it wrong, God still loves us anyway. A few months ago, my wife bought a new car. Well, it was a new car to us. It was really a used car, excuse me, a pre-owned car. We, we checked all the relevant websites and drove all over town looking at cars. And sometimes we'd see a price we liked, but there'd be a tag on the car that said, as is. Hmm. No warranty. No guarantees to the condition of this car. No refunds, no promises. What you see is what you get. Not sure I like that. Not sure I trust a car without any warranty at all. But when talking about people, as is, is exactly how God accepts us and loves us. As is with no strings attached. As is denotes that the seller is selling and the buyer is buying an item in whatever condition it presently exists and that the buyer is accepting the item with all its faults, whether or not they're immediately apparent. And friends, that's exactly how God accepts us and loves us. As is, no strings attached, with all our faults, whether or not they're immediately apparent. God's love is unconditional. God's love is anyway love. It's as is love. It's unconditional love. You see, when you know you are loved unconditionally, it recenters and refocuses your life. Many people are seeking meaning in their life. In my opinion, the meaning of life is to love God and love your neighbor, and through the expression of that love, bring glory to God. Once you've experienced the meaning of life and you begin to love God and love your neighbor as yourself, you soon discover that this anyway, as is, unconditional love can be applied to your love for yourself. This anyway, as is love actually actuates this love for yourself. And once that love is actuated in your life, you can begin to love yourself unconditionally too, and that is important. For self-esteem is a big issue in our lives. We, who live in the most richly blessed nation of all, have some of the worst self-esteem in the whole world. We look in the mirror and only see what's wrong in our lives instead of what's right. We only see that we, what we don't have instead of rejoicing in what we do have. And that's contrary to God's view of us. We've bought into the hype of advertising. No matter what product we use, all the other te tells us that what we're using isn't good enough. We're not hip enough. Today's fashion bandwagon is tomorrow's fashion faux pas. The world tells us we are worthless unless we're buying what it deems is the hottest thing on the market or buying into its philosophy of life. Let's go back to the beginning. After the first few days of creation. Do you remember? After every single day, God said, that's good. And then after God created humankind, God said, that's very good. God's actuating love reminds us that God loves us anyway and as is without any conditions. I'm pretty sure God doesn't mind upgrades or better maintenance or even a new paint job every now and then, but God still loves us anyway and as is. And that enables us to love ourselves with the very same unconditional love. And I believe those are the two loves we're searching for. Unconditional love and acceptance by God and unconditional love and acceptance by and for ourselves. 
In London's famed British Museum, you'll find the ancient Rosetta Stone. It was discovered in 1799 by troops of Napoleon near the city of Rosetta in Egypt. The stone was originally inscribed by priests of Ptolemy V in the second century BC and contains the same text written in hieroglyphics and in Greek. Because the scholars knew Greek, they were able to use the stone to unlock the mysteries of the ancient Egyptian language for the very first time. In the same way, Jesus, the Son of God, is our Rosetta Stone. Through his sacrificial love on the cross for our sake, we can now decipher the meaning of life and the love of God. Through Jesus, we discover that God's love is unconditional. No matter what we've done, God loves us anyway. God loves us as is, accepting us with all our faults unconditionally. In our love for God, our love for ourselves is actuated. So if you're lost, lonely, left out, or looking for love in all the wrong places, today you've come to the right place. Because in God, you belong. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you that you love us despite our flaws and that there's always a seat at your table for us. Lord, help us to accept your grace, to accept that grace and to allow us to give ourselves more grace so that we might love ourselves like you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Today I want to offer Holy Communion to all of those who are worshiping at home. I know it's been so long since we've been together and been able to share in this holy meal. And there are some, certainly some theological questions that come up in terms of um, being able to, to have communion um, while we are dispersed. But I believe that the God of the universe who's able to create the universe out of nothing, to who can create us out of the dust of the earth and can bring back his son from the dead, can also make a sacrament of a simple meal over technology. And so I think it's important that we are able to share in this holy meal together from time to time as Jesus asked us to. So I'm using just very basic things that I would find at my house. I've got a Dixie cup um, in order to uh, take the juice. I've just got some rosemary olive oil bread um, that we would normally have at our home. And so I invite you to, to find such things as well as we gather for Holy Communion. The Lord is with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to God, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. 
that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us wherever we are gathered and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Just as Christ's body was broken for us, we break this bread that we might share in this holy meal, recognizing that Christ has died for us. And as Jesus poured out his blood for us, we remember this day that Christ's blood was shed for us. I invite you, if you are with others in your family, um, that you might take the opportunity to break off a piece of bread and give one to the other and say, this is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. If you're alone as I am today, I invite you to partake with yourself, knowing that you are gathering with other rightfully united Methodist Christians today in this holy meal. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. No matter who you are or what you've done, God loves you anyway. He loves you as is. He loves you unconditionally. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that whosoever shall believe in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Go in peace, accepting the grace that God has given you. Amen. Go now in peace, 
go now and 